He is the tower of salvation for His kingdom and showeth mercy to His anointed unto David and to His seed forevermore. Father, help us that we might hear from heaven. God, not that we've not already heard, but God, that You might take what You've already said and done and build upon that through this message and compliment Yourself as we open our hearts to receive what it would be the Holy Spirit would give us today. Give me grace, Lord, to say everything that's on my heart. God, to say it in a way that's pleasing to You, that will accomplish Your will. And God, just give us a clarity of mind and thought to speak, to hear, and to receive. And to do what You would will. And we'll thank You and praise You for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Trouble, trouble, trouble in the minds and hearts of people in this day that we live in. So many troubling things, so much troubling news, so many troubling times that people find in their lives and in their way. David was a man of many sorrows. He was a man that knew the lowest lows, but he also knew the highest highs. David had been through the fire. David had seen great victory. He had suffered great defeat. But as we come now to the conclusion of this book of 2 Samuel, only two chapters follow this one. David just pulls over and for the whole chapter gives God glory for delivering his soul, his life, and his body. And so as we look at this this morning, I'll give you a title if you want one, as the heart of the delivered soul. The heart of the delivered soul. Now, by way of introduction, I just want to look at a few things together as we oftentimes do. But I want you to think about this as pertaining to the heart of this delivered soul. In this verse, first, second, rather, Samuel, chapter 22 and verse 50, you find the word thank for the first time in all of Scripture. Now that, that surprised me when I saw that because you would just think there's an awful lot of Bible between Genesis 1-1 and 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 50. But this is the first time you find the word thanks. And the first time you find the form of the word thanks is only five times in chapter 7 of the book of Leviticus where it talks about the sacrifice or offering of thanksgiving, which is more a legal obligation as pertaining to the law of Moses as God dictate, dictates to the people what it is that they're supposed to do to express or to offer their thanksgiving. So this again is not an outpouring or an outcry of thanks, but rather a legal mandate within the law of God as pertaining to the people concerning the offering of thanks to God for what He's done for His people. But the first time that we see the word thanks here is in 1st, 2nd Samuel, I'm sorry, chapter 22, verse 50. As you look at this together, there's a few things to think about as we think about this verse uh, uh, together. Several verses that we're going to glance at as we go through this introduction. The first thing that I want you to think about as the heart of the delivered soul. Now, five times in this chapter, which subsequently is the number of grace in a study of numerology and scripture, five times in this chapter, David uses this word delivered. I don't think that's accidental. <laughs> But we'll look at a few things together as we go through this, kind of by introduction for the message. The first thing that I want you to know is the heart of the delivered soul is a heart of prayer. The heart of the delivered soul is a heart of prayer. What's interesting about people, and especially about myself, I don't have, I, I'm, I'm no doctor by any means, and so I don't have the ability to diagnose physical, emotional, nor spiritual problems. But one thing that I can do is parallel most situations to my own. And I can tell when a child of God has trouble. For the most part, when a Christian comes to me and they're struggling with something, whatever it may be, I can usually knock the fruit off the tree and get to the root of the problem because it's the same problem that I've had and that's their fellowship with the Lord. If your marriage is in trouble, if your finances are in trouble, if your walk is in trouble, if your witness is in trouble, if whatever you find yourself in is in trouble today, you can usually go back way beyond just the temporal things that you're being troubled by and get to the eternal issue that you're troubled with, and that is the fact that we're all sinners. And when given to the, the impulse of our flesh, we will deny fellowship with God. And in denial of fellowship with God, we begin to deny ourselves the proportionate blessings 
that come into the life of a child of God when we do what He tells us to do. He wants us to pray. God wants us to pray. One of the greatest difficulties that befall any marriage or any relationship is a lack of what? Communication. A lack of communication. When I lack communication with my wife, with my children, things don't gel. If I lack communication with the people I've been called to lead, things do not gel. Have you ever worked for a boss who was a poor communicator? Is that not one of the most difficult things? They tell you to do something, you do it, and then they're displeased because you didn't do it like they wanted, and you want to say, if you want me to do it that way, tell me to do it that way, right? When I fail in communication with God, I'm setting myself up for failure in so many other areas of my life. The heart of the delivered soul is a heart of prayer. Notice with me here as we look together at these verses in verse 4 of 2 Samuel chapter 20. He says in verse 4, I will call on the Lord. Now what gets him to verse 4? Well, verse 1. As you start out talking about being delivered, David makes this statement in verse 1 of chapter 22. David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of A-L-L, all of his enemies. This is the day that he had secured deliverance from all of his enemies that he began to cry out praises to the Lord. He says in verse 2, he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Now in verse 4, David says, I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Isn't it interesting that little bitty phrase, so shall I be, which denotes obligation to the first part of the verse. I will be saved, he says in verse 4. No, we're not talking about the salvation of the soul, but being delivered from enemies. I will be saved, he says in verse 4, from my enemies, so as I call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. If you want to turn that around. As I call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be delivered. What are you saying? I'm saying God wants to hear from you. I will call on the name of the Lord. Jeremiah 33, 3, God says, call on me. And I will answer and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. The heart of the delivered soul is a heart of prayer. You can go on in verse 7 and see where he makes this statement. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. And cried to my God. And He did hear my voice out of His temple. And He did hear my cry as they entered into His ears. That God heard His prayer. With confidence He prayed. Knowing that God would hear His prayer. The heart of the delivered soul. Can I ask you this morning, are you delivered? Has God set you free? What a, what a song, song service this morning. I'm telling you, I'm going to go ahead and ask forgiveness on the front end for the day that I start running circles around this front of this church during the song service. If I do and it bothers you, just look up at the ceiling and count the lights or the vent, whatever you got to do to distract yourself because I'm telling you, I can't stand it. It just If it gets up in me, it's got to get out. Amen? <laughs> I, I'm just telling you this morning that to be delivered, to be set free for those who've been saved this morning, and you know that you're saved. Those who will say, I know I'm saved. I know I'm free. I've been free from the chains and the bonds of my sin. I've been free from my enemies that God brought you through as we sing Amazing Grace all the time through many dangers, toils, and snares. I've already come. That God, we don't have to start looking to the future or looking to the present. present. We can look to the past and do cartwheels for eternity because it's through many dangers, toils, and snares. I've already been brought by His grace. And it's brought me safe this far then surely grace is going to lead me home. <laughs> the heart cry of the delivered is a heart of prayer. It's where we have to, in our spirit, dominate the will of the flesh and humble ourselves before a mighty God. And as David said, in my distress, I called on the name of the Lord. And he asked God to help him. And God set him free. Not only is the heart of the delivered soul, a heart of prayer. Also, you see, as we continue there in verse 7, it's a heart of praise. I'm going to call on the name of the Lord. I cried out to the name of the Lord. He heard my voice. He says, again, we don't have to look back in verse 4 that He's worthy to be praised. Now you look at verse 14. 
I love this statement. David says, The Lord thundered from heaven. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered His voice. That gives me that, that little tingle. In my distress, I called on the Lord. When I was hurt and in need of deliverance, I called on the Lord. And the Most High heard my prayer and thundered His voice. He was to be heard. Do you remember in your time? Let's just go personally if you can. If you can't, we'll give you an invitation here shortly. But let's go personally in that time when as a sinner lost and undone without Christ that you did not understand the importance of your salvation. You did not understand how necessary it was for you to humble yourself and invite Christ into your heart as Lord and ruler of your life. You did not get it. No, you heard it. And you heard it and you heard it. You did not receive it. You did not want it. Nor did you appreciate it. But do you remember when the Almighty cleared his voice and thundered from heaven and it didn't matter what mama said or what Aunt Sookie said for the first time in your life you heard what God said and that was for you to die without Christ was to spend eternity in hell and the only way to be freed from your sin to have your soul delivered from hell was to be born again by the Spirit of God and the Almighty while uttering in His voice such words reminded you that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life and you fell on your knees or you pulled over on the side of the road or you walked an aisle and knelt at an altar and you prayed and you asked God to forgive you your sins and save your soul. Do you remember when God cleared His voice and He thundered to your heart those words? Man in the deliverance set free. The heart of the delivered soul is a voice, a heart, if you will, of prayer. It's a heart of praise as he continues on now. In verse 18, David says, He delivered me from my strong enemy. It's funny how oftentimes you've got to get on the other side of deliverance to look back and realize just how strong a grip the enemy really had on your life. Now maybe in the midst of it, you thought you had the ability to overcome, yet time and time and again, whether you confessed it or not, you proved to yourself that you did not. Time and time and again, you stumbled in failure, doing your best by your own pride and your own ambition to overcome the things of this world and overcome the sins of your flesh, but you realized failure after failure after failure that you could not do it on your own. But when God reached down and God delivered you from your situation and God brought you through the fire and God brought you through whatever it was that had condemned your life and condemned your soul and pulled you, if you will, out of the fire, whether it be when delivering your soul from hell or delivering your life from the torments of this earth. When God delivered you and God pulled you through those things, out of those things, then you can look back and realize only by the grace of an act of God can we look back and realize just how strong of a grip. The enemy has. You know what? Long ago we mourned the loss of a big dumb gorilla. Because they shot him because there was a kid in there. And they said that that gorilla, a gorilla has the ability in a coconut to take it in his hand. You've got to have a hammer to bust it. And he can squeeze that coconut and pop it in his hand like nothing. I've always said that about a squirrel. If a squirrel busts a hickory nut in his jaw, I don't want one biting me. Amen? <laughs> But you know what's funny? Our enemy didn't grab us like that gorilla grabs that coconut. It's kind of like a python or an anaconda. Those, those, those snakes that slowly, casually, delicately weave their way up and before you know have complete control of you and you don't know it until they begin to squeeze. That's kind of how the enemy... Have you ever seen old witch theory about them? And it can be one of the prettiest balloons and prettiest blossoms you've ever seen. But do you know what lies beneath that wisteria vine? Death. It takes over everything it touches. And the ultimate end of what it has hold of is death. Sometimes it's on this side. And there's some of you I've seen already smiling and bobbing your heads because you know you've looked back and recognized that He had hold of you. And if it weren't for the prime grace of the hand of God, He'd still have a hold of you. 
but God. He delivered me, he says, verse 18, from my strong enemy and from them that hated me, for they were too strong for me. I believe with all of my heart today there is somebody in this room that needs to get hold of the reality that your enemies, who you think you are in control of today, are too strong for you. And the only way out is to humble yourself and submit yourself to an almighty God. He goes on as this voice of praise cries out. In verse 20, he makes this statement. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because He delighted in me. The Lord, He says in verse 21, rewarded me according to my righteousness, David says, according to the cleanness of my hands, He had recompensed me. What is He saying? Well, to the child of God, He's saying that through our perseverance, in order to flee to God and to maintain a life of holiness and sanctification that we will be appropriately blessed and delivered from the fires of life if we do not submit to the will of the enemy. David said, as my hands were clean and as I had given my life to walk for Him, as I had submitted myself to do the things of God, He brought me out of that place because He delighted in me. And according to my righteousness, He says, and the cleanness of my hands, He recompensed me. What does that mean? That means to you now, child of God, who thinks you can dabble in darkness. To you, child of God, who thinks you can back out of everything God's called you to do. To you, child of God, who thinks you can walk the line. And as John said, there's no fellowship between the light and the darkness. You somehow have delivered in your mind the news to yourself that you can ride the fence and work it out just right. God says when you fall off of that fence on the wrong side of this thing, you're going to not be rewarded and blessed by the things of God until you repent and get back on the right side of the field. People's walking in the darkness praying for a ray of sunshine. Friend, if you want a ray of sunshine, head to the light. If you want illumination, get out of the darkness. Stop playing games at the foot of the cross. Stop dabbling in religion. I heard a man preach the other night. He said people have got enough religion to bug them, but not enough to bless them. <laughs> Quit looking at the things of God as, a, as, a, as an inconvenience and flee to God. You know, one of the heart cries of a delivered person, one of the evidences that will be very well to see in the life of one who's been delivered is a change of devotion will be reflected by a change of action. Amen. When somebody really gets a hold of this, it's funny how our excuses will change. This is the rabbit. You ready? All the excuses that we make not to go to church We'll flip around, as my, as my older people used to tell me, spin that pie around and get you a bite out of the other side. And instead of saying, I can't go to church today because we're playing ball, maybe we'll start saying, I quit playing ball today because we get to go to church. Amen. Now, I've never been of the fortunate uh, 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 pocket loads of money that I could go on vacation for more than six days. Right? But if you're of the affluent and blessed that can take 10, 12, 14 days of vacation, by all means, spend that time with your family. But if it's a matter of scheduling, I would encourage you to be in church and take those other six days and live it up. Why? Because when the hellfire comes into your life and the storms of this world, they, they, can, can I get a little fall horn leg on them? Things are coming. Amen? And when they do, God's going to recompense your deliverance in light of the righteousness and cleanness of your hands. And if you're so busy trying to see the heavens of this world, you might miss the heaven of the afterlife. If you're so busy trying to see the things that need to be seen and do the things that undo, our kids know everything. Our kids know what every beach in America looks like. Our kids know how every ball practice, every function, every game, every tournament. You're getting tight on me now. I'll stay here another hour. Our kids know how to participate in every function, every activity. We're so scared of what our kids are going to miss. Everything but heaven. Everything but a word from God. Everything but a devotion to the house of God and to the work of God and to the will of God so they can know the word of God and be the workers that God needs them to be. But we don't encourage that. Anything I give more attention than I give God is an idol. Amen. David said, why is this important? This I'm not... This, Listen, why is it important? The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. You're not going to get it. I 
righteous at work. You're not going to get righteous at the gas station. You're going to get righteous by sitting in a relationship with the Word of God. And I believe with all my heart, without one exception, your relationship with the Word of God in your private life will be no more sincere than your relationship with God in through the church. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. As my friend, the prophet Jerry Chaddick said, no, but you do if you want to be a good one. <laughs> Amen? I'm still in the introduction. Is that all right? Everybody look at their watch. Verse 27. It's not a voice of prayer. It's not just a heart of praise. It's a heart of practice. Well, we've learned how to walk it. I'm sorry. We've learned how to talk it. But we've learned how to wave the banner. We've learned how to get the bumper stickers. We've learned our t-shirt. Now, nah? Honk if you love Jesus. We know it. Well, we've learned how to put these spirited Facebook posts on there. Buddy, you talk about religion. You can get blessed you get on Facebook. But you know what's funny about what James said is blessings and curses don't come out of the same mouth. Just like good water and bad water don't come out of the same fountain. So how you bless God on one hand, put a picture of yourself half naked on the other? <laughs> this is a crowd building a sermon, <laughs> How can I put how good God is on one Facebook post? And then on the next Facebook post, I'm ranting and raving about community things and using cuss words and lying and cheating and stealing and, and name calling and gossiping. Doesn't make sense, does it? So what are you saying? I'm saying it's more, your prayer is a private thing. Your praise can be both private and public. But here's what's interesting. This is the proof that's in the pudding. This is if the root of the plum tree is a plum tree, then the fruit of the plum tree is going to be plum. We got a lot of people with signs in front of the plum tree that say I'm a plum tree. Right? But there's no plum. Matter of fact, some are the complete opposite. One thing I've learned in 10 years of this is when it gets this tight, just keep plowing. Amen. <laughs> Because the harder the ground, the deeper the plow has to go. To break it up and make it further. So let's plow for a minute. The practice of the heart of the delivered soul, verse 27. He says, with the pure thou wilt show thyself pure, and with the froward thou wilt show thyself unsaved. Who's David talking to? God. You want to see the pure blessings of God? You want to see God reconcile families, fix problems? You want to see mountains moving, miraculous, holy God, Jehovah God, Almighty God, El Shaddai? You want to see Jesus? Do you want to see Jesus? Then walk in purity is what he says. And I think it's interesting that David makes this statement as he talks to God. He says that you will be with the pure, showing yourself pure. You want to see the pure blessing, the unadulterated blessings of God? Then strive to be as God has called you to be. Come out and be holy as He is holy. <coughs> we say about meditation sometimes when we talk about prayer that it's hard to talk about meditation without thinking about some monk with his legs crossed and some incense burning and his eyes crossed. <laughs> right? That's what we think about with meditation, so it's hard for us to tell about meditation, teach about biblical meditation without our minds going there. And it's kind of the same way with holiness, because with holiness, as soon as I say the word holy, the first place my, my mind, my carnal mind will go sometime is to this old, gray-headed, long, white-bearded man in a robe with a big staff and a Bible under his arm saying, Thou shalt not. Right? But that's not holiness either. That's a distorted image. Holiness is the people of God seeking to obey the God of the people. Holiness is our striving for something that we can never achieve, but keeping our eyes on He who did achieve it. The author and finisher of our faith, who for the glory that was set before Him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, wherefore He says, let us run our race with patience and do as God's called us to do. Practice. The practice 
of the heart of the delivered soul, the practice is to do as God has called us to do. Walk in impurity, as he says in verse 27. In verse 44, he makes this statement, Thou also hast delivered me from the strivings of my people. Thou hast kept me to be head of the heathen of people which I knew not shall serve me. In David's particular context, what David is saying are the people that hate me, the heathens that are against me, I never dreamed would serve me. This is King David. And David says, God has made those who don't even strive with me to serve me and to come under my kingship. Parallel to us in our day is those who strive to hurt us, God can use to bless us. I wound up with that stone. That God will take the people who seek to hurt us and despise us and do rent with us and use them to bless us. And if you need a New Testament example, let me introduce you to a man called Saul of Tarsus. Who was one of the greatest enemies of the New Testament church in the book of Acts until God saved him. And he since then, even to this day, has been one of the greatest blessings the New Testament church has ever known. Only God can do that. And that's what happens when the church keeps practicing, when the church keeps pressing, when we keep preaching, when we keep praying, when we keep pressing on and praising God. We can bless God and God can bless us. we got to do what God's called us to do. The heart of the delivered soul is to put into practice the things of God and facilitate the Word of God in our lives. And it's not going to happen as long as we're distracted by the things of this world and as long as we're devoted to the things of this world. And and as long as we try to ride the fence and live like the devil six days a week and show up, put up a church face on Sunday, it ain't going to happen, Captain. If you want many over blessings, keep riding the fence. If you want to see God rear back and put something on your family, then you need to get to this altar this morning and repent of all that foolishness and ask God to do a work in your heart and your life. And I'm telling you, beloved, He'll do it. Because you're dealing with a preacher this morning who rode the fence. You're dealing with a preacher this morning who went to some places I didn't need to go as a Christian. You're looking at a preacher this morning that wasn't always in the pulpit. You're looking at a man this morning that had to make a decision almost 12 years ago when I got on my knees and begged God to forgive me and use me before He killed me. And 12 years later, like a Cinderella story, <laughs> here I am in Nipitos, Louisiana. Thank God for it. You got to put into practice. We can keep posting, we can keep putting bumper stickers, we can keep wearing the t-shirt, but bless God, if we don't roll our sleeves up, get off the fence, stop living like the rest of the world, looking like the rest of the world, acting like the rest of the world, and get in church, amen, and do what God wants us to do, and be what God wants us to be. May we raise our kids to know how important of a place this is, not just by word, but by deed. <laughs> I got four minutes and three points to a sermon. Can we do it? I guarantee you we can because I knew this was coming. How many of you let me go five more minutes? Five, ten, fifteen, twenty. <laughs> three quick things. Verse 50 and verse 51 is where we'll be for just a moment. He says to us in verse 50 now, you see his committed understanding. David says in verse 50, Therefore I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, I will sing praises unto thy name. You see an expression of thanks. He says that I will. I will what? I will give. I will give what? I will give thanks. Amen. An expression of thanks. You see an example of thankfulness. Where is he going to give thanks? Among the heathen? Now you want to talk about being among the heathen? Welcome to 3501 Highway 828. <laughs> Behind us is the world-renowned creek known as the Luder. There's probably been more laws broken on the Luder. Amen. <coughs> Amen. You come sit in the dining room with me in my red recliner with my cup of coffee and watch out that window with me from about 4 o'clock in the morning until daylight and scratch your head as I do about all the traffic going up down this road. There are drugs going up down this road. There are drunks going up down this road. There are prostitutes going up down this road. There is sin going up down this road. What an example. What a testimony. Not to see just a parking lot full of cars, but for them to drive by in their sin and see your car in the parking lot. What are we going to do? We're going to give thanks. Where? Among the heathen. 
Can I tell you, I don't know where else in Union Parish we could be planted any more firmly among the heathen. Amen? Amen. God knows what He's doing. The first church I ever pastored was in a community called Rum Center. They said years ago when the train came to Junction City, Packers would be lined up for a hundred yards with barrels, or to buy barrels of sugar. Why? So they could get back to the bushes and make their, make their drink. And 115 years ago, somebody thought it was a good idea to put a church right in the middle of Rome Center. Amen? Why? Let's give thanks among the heathen. But here's what's interesting about this world. You can put it wherever you wanted to. We'd be among the heathen. Because we live in a heathenistic world. A heathenistic society. So what do we do? Give thanks among the heathen. An expression of thanks. An example of thankfulness. And you see an uh, I'm sorry. Uh, you, you see an experience of thanksgiving. I will what? I will give thanks among the heathen. I will sing praises. I'm going to lift my voice. I'm going to let it ring. He says, verse 50, O Lord, among the heathen, and I will sing praises unto thy name. I'll sing praises unto thy name. Not only do you see his committed understanding, and through this committed understanding, we can see so many things change in this world and in our own world. He goes on, and you see in verse 51 now, his confirmed understanding. Not only his committed undertaking, but his confirmed understanding in verse 51. He says that he is the tower of the salvation of his king. David, as the king of the nation of Israel, was under the anointed hand of God to do what God had called him to do. We can parallel this to the, to the act of the call of the child of God to do what God's called us to do. And as we seek to do the will of God, there will be those who rise up against us. And when they rise up against us as the redeemed of the Lord who must say so and as the saved of Almighty God, we have a place to go. We have a place to go as a strong tower of our salvation. What is a tower? A tower, by definition, is a fortified, in this Hebrew word, was a fortified city. He's saying that God is a fortified city of salvation, that it's a place that we can go to to be fortified. What does the word fortified mean? I'm glad you asked. The word fortified means strengthened against an attack. So against the attacks of this world, what does that mean? That means you can expect to be attacked. <laughs> But in that attack, we have a place to go to the fortified refuge city of Almighty God. Why? Because we are the fruit of His salvation. He is the tower of salvation, he says in verse 51. He goes on and says he shows mercy to the anointed. He's talking about where his security was. His security was in the merciful hand of an almighty sovereign God. Why his security was? Because of his anointing. Isn't it good to be a child of God? Well, that was hard. I'm glad to be saved this morning. Amen. And in being saved, I'm glad that no matter what matters, some of you wringing your hands word to death. I've heard more people say that America was over. If so-and-so wins the election in 2016, same people said in 2012, same one said in 2008. I've been hearing this for the last 12 years, 15 years. You go on back, they keep saying, well, this one's going to kill America, that one's going to kill America. Let me tell you who's going to make or break America. Jesus Christ. It's going to make or break America. And it don't matter who's in the White House. You better get a hold of who's on the throne and do what God wants us to do if we're going to have anything worth any value in our families or in our churches. He goes on now, this confirmed understanding where his security was was in that tower. Why his security was is because he's a child of God. And the last thing we see is confidence in his undergirding. Not only the undertaking that he had, but the understanding that he had. And now the undergirding that he has. Personal undergirding. David says that he's going to take care of David. Powerful undergirding. That he says not only for David, but to all the anointed and a perpetual undergirding in the God will carry the burden of His people not only today and tomorrow, but forevermore. Only God, the heart of the delivered soul, are in the air that He 
years, bro. It's a loop. You put me first, and you make me first, and he'll bring you first. And you'll get to see the good things of God. We're all the altar. If you're here today and you've never been saved, and you don't know what it means to be delivered, why don't you come out into this altar and let us take the Bible and show you how to be saved? Get born again right here in this service. Wouldn't that be tremendous? Maybe you're saved and you've been on the fence. Maybe you're saved. You've dabbled in darkness. You've allowed the things of this world to distract you. Maybe they've come between you and your family, you and your spouse, you and the Lord. There ain't nothing wrong with an old fashioned call to repentance. That we as a people of God just get on our knees and say, God, forgive me. Or maybe for you who have been delivered, who have been on the right side of this thing for some time now, maybe you just want to come to the altar and David says, give thanks. Let him have his way this morning. Let him have his way. Whatever you think God wants you to do, go above and beyond. That. Don't sell it short. Go above and beyond what you think he wants right now. And I promise you, he'll bless you. You'll never walk out of here regretting having done more than you thought you should have. But there will be many, can anybody testify, there will be a many in the service you walk out wishing you'd done more than you did. Stand with me.